Here's something about the train car that I'm trying to turn into a retail space and podcast studio. I had a meeting with the contractor this week. I just needed to figure out very basic first steps of what to do to get the place started. And it came down to this, new flooring and painting and patching up the roof and walls. I need that just so I can start moving things in there to put everything I want to do under one roof. So after figuring out what he should do, and last time I mentioned that he wasn't able to move in there right away, so to try and keep things moving, we started ripping up the carpet ourselves. But here's something that was an obvious problem. After the fact, where were we going to put all this carpet? It was now just in the middle of the floor. Didn't really think to get a dumpster at this point. Tried calling that got junk pickup service, but they wanted to charge like 300 bucks to take it away, so forget that. And also, didn't really do the neatest job pulling it up. As I said, there's a giant mound of carpet just in the middle of the train. I wasn't even sure how it was gonna get out of the door at this point. But the landlord had people renovating a building next door. So we asked if we could just have them haul it away. And they did do that, which was a really lucky break. So that worked out. I mean, I knew it wouldn't be a quick process. I just wanted to be able to get in there and start doing stuff. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. person that I meet today is another person who reached out to me on the American Bandito mailing list. I'm JDC, writer and co-creator of the webcomic series Conceptual Heist. And I would like to add that this is the first time I have actually talked to a person on this show that is in Canada. So that was kind of cool. So you're a writer. You're not, you're not a yeah. comic book artist. You're a comic book writer. Yes. So how did yeah. you get started in that? I used to work in film about 20 odd years ago. I had gotten a couple of screenwriting gigs and that, nothing that ever got produced. The process of it always sort of frustrated me in that I'm sitting there coming up with ideas, pitching projects and that sort of thing. And then somebody who has no idea on how to tell a story comes up and sort of says, well, we need this, we need that. Sometimes you get some good notes, but I think the best way of describing film executives is what Brian Michael Bendis used to do is that every time he went in to talk about a Spider-Man movie or a TV show or something that he was connected with, there was always some executive somewhere who would go, but does it need to be a spider? People don't like spiders. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get started in working in film? I uh, met a producer and I at a bar one night. It was a producer who was working at a small film production company up here in Montreal back when there were tons of films being made here all the time. And I started talking about how I want to make films, what kind of films I want to make. Uh, and we were just chatting about films and we really hit it off. And they were like, well, you don't have a background, but I can give you some work in the office. So I started doing go for work. And that's sort of like, okay, you're doing really well with that. Can you set up and register these this film we just finished with all these film festivals. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I'd spend a day on the phone in the office, just calling up film festivals, that sort of thing. And they're doing well. And I'm spending more and more time in getting to know everybody there. And then I picked up a graphic novel and I'm like, hey, you should read this. This could make for a really great film. And it was right when things like the X-Men movie were starting, was starting production and they were talking about a Spider-Man movie and that sort of thing. I'm like, Comics are about to break out again in uh, film. It's Batman and Robin didn't kill it completely. There are all these cool indie um, films coming out that aren't necessarily breaking the bank, but they're making reputations. So how did you move over into writing your own stuff? I sort of rumbled and stumbled. I had a few projects that sort of moved forward a bit and then fell apart, moved forward a bit, fell apart. And I had actually quit writing for five years that ended up being like the five most miserable years of my life. What did you do instead? Renovations. Uh, oh, you like flat at, out gave up creative stuff altogether. Oh, yeah. I was working in renovations. I was working in schools and that sort of thing. They were great jobs. I'm glad I've had them. My depression just was not getting me into a sort of happy point. And then a friend of mine sort of said, why don't you you always talk about these story ideas you have, sit down and write one. So I'd start writing and like projects would fall apart, but I'd be feeling better while I was writing. And then um, I was working as a video game tester and I started working with one of my coworkers 
on my first webcomic, uh, The Unfinding of Erasmus Civitatum. So you started working as a video game tester. Okay, I'm sure like there are tons of people in the world going, so how did you do that? I applied. Um, <laughs> oh, that's it. All right. Video game testing is the, oh, you want a job in video games? Here's where you start. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the wrong place, that's where you end. Oh, um, <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, you can get stuck there writing video games for centuries, uh, sort of just testing video games. A friend of mine who used to test video games as well, he called it uh, game testing lethargy because it sounds fun. It sounds great. Oh, I play video games all day. Right. Except that like you're playing video games with a checklist of things you have to do. It's sort of like having, oh, I have to check and make sure that every wall in this game is solid that you can't walk through any point in any wall in this game it's not yeah. like hey we finished this game it's fully done go play it and tell me what you think it's we want to see if this part works yes so you started doing the uh the unfinding of erasmus you said the unfinding of erasmus civitatum one of my co-workers was a big 2000 ad mobius and Drule fan and we'd be sitting there talking and i sort of said well, how about we do a comic together, right? Sort of like uh, the actual idea sparked from Warren Ellis did a web comic with Jason Howard. And it, the idea was that they were doing a panel, like one strip every day of the week. And I showed it to him I'm, and we sort of finished looking at it and looking at the statement for it. And we looked at each other and said, we could do this. Mm -hmm. And he sort of said, but I can't do one every day to do about two a week. So we broke it down and we did an eight page story together twice a week. He decided that he didn't want to continue with the series. I found another artist who ended up having life get in the way. So the pro that fell apart. And then a friend of mine was sort of like, well, why not sit down and just write it as a novel? Mm -hmm. It's NaNoWriMo coming up in five days. Why don't you write it as a novel? So I sat down, wrote it as a novel, realized I hate writing novels. <laughs> okay. Writing comics, I send the script to the artist, and the artist can turn around and go, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. Fix it. Writing a novel, you're sort of sitting there alone for 80,000 words, and you don't know if what you're writing is any good or not. There are some chunks I'm very happy with in that novel. Other chunks I'm sort of like, eh. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to actually publish it. I'm glad to know that, oh, I can write a novel. I just don't like the experience. Oh, so you never even put it out. You just... No. How no. far did you got to... You got through the whole thing, though? Yeah, I finished the entire book, realized about halfway through the book that it wasn't one book. It was actually a trilogy. So if I do publish it, that means I have two other novels I have to write. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. I don't ever feel like I'm able to come up with anything when I try to write a story. Jay tells me about why he started the current comic that he's doing. I had finished writing the novel and I was working on another comic project that fell through, but I was sitting next to the artist, Matt Gagnon, the co-creator of Conceptual Heist, and he had been doing a web comic called Yoni Yoshi, and I sort of gave him a few pointers on some of his page layout and that sort of thing. And we started talking about comics theory. I asked him if he wanted to do a comic together, and he gave me a very direct no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now let's just sit here in silence. And I was working on this other project. During my lunch hour, my girlfriend, now wife at the time, called me up, and she's sort of like, she hadn't been feeling well for a month. Like she had been everything she ate, she was throwing up. So she went to go see her doctor. They thought it was gallstones. And as they were giving sort of the ultrasound for the gallstones, the guy who does ultrasounds was like, um, it actually looks like you might be pregnant. I was going to say, I was hoping it wasn't going to like go a horrible way. I'm like, please let it be a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and so she calls and she's like, whispering because she's at her desk at her office and she's like i think i'm pregnant <laughs> and she's sort of like are you all right and i'm like i'm fantastic mm -hmm. <laughs> so like at the end of lunch i'm walking back to my desk i'm just smiling ear to ear and super happy 
the next day I'm talking to Matt because he I had sort of said, yeah, maybe we should do something do a short comic together or something. And he's like, yeah, that could be cool. So like, if I don't start making comics now, I'm not going to have the time once this kid is born. Yeah, you got to work it into your schedule now so it becomes yeah. part of what you do. So I pitched this idea to Matt and it just started running right off the bat from there. I pitched the idea of a science fiction art theft story. And he was sort of like, okay, cool. Unfortunately, I didn't have a plan when I started. I went with just pure improvisation from the top. By around page three, I was sort of like, I need to start planning what I'm doing because you can't pull off an art heist and not have a plan. No, it's, <laughs> you have a plan, the plan screws up, and then your second plan screws up, and then you have this great improv moment where it just becomes this magic trick, which was actually part of my notes in that, it's sort of like, if this happens in chapter one, chapter two, we're doing this, chapter three, we're doing that, chapter four, we're doing this. And at the end of chapter four and going into chapter five, I have magic trick it as my note in the original <laughs> outline. So by the time I'm starting chapter four, I'm like, I don't know what the magic trick is anymore. And at that point, I was working with a friend of mine who was working as my editor, Sean Bechu. And he's sort of like, well, what was the first plan? What was the second plan? What does she have available to her? And what, where do you want her to end up during this plan? So it's sort of like, okay, if I work backwards using those, I will have an idea on what equipment she has, how she can get in and out of things, and so on and so forth. And it was just sort of like, okay, yeah, that works, and built it up that way. It's a writing method I kind of ended up stealing from uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick. She knows where she wants her stories to end whenever she's breaking down a single-issue chapter, so she'll start at page 22 and work backwards. So that way the whole thing is nicely constructed. It's not always easy. I get what you're saying, but me, I'm not a writer. So when you're saying that, I'm like, oh, that's genius. I'd have no idea how to pull that off, but that's genius. <laughs> Jay is another of the many artists that I've met that has done a Kickstarter for what he's working on. And I always love to hear about what types of projects work and what ones don't. Kickstarters fascinate me. So I've never started yeah. one. I always thought about starting one. Tell me about what made you decide to start it and around what time you decided to start it. And I had seen comic creators use it. A couple of my friends had used it for funding their books. And I was sort of like, I don't have money to do a print run of graphic novels. And even when I was making uh, The Unfinding of Erasmus Civitatum, it's sort of like, well, we could sell it to a publisher. And if that doesn't happen, we could do a trade paperback through Kickstarter. And about a year into the series, I started listening to the uh, Comics Launch podcast. I'd sit down with each podcast half the time and be taking notes. He started offering classes like mini courses online. I'd take those. And then he has longer running courses that I've taken since then. While I was sort of doing all this, I started emailing Tyler James, who does the podcast. I started emailing him back and forth every now and then and asking him questions. And he turned around and said, well, you finished the first chapter. It's 26 pages. You have a full issue comic. Why don't you do a Kickstarter for that? And then you even have something to sell at conventions and something that's a taste for readers to pick up and something that you can sell. And I was like, well, we were only thinking of doing the trade. And it's like, you can still do the trade and the single issue. You can do the single issue and stop there if you want. And I couldn't think of a reason why not to do the first single issue. So I sat down and started looking at Kickstarters and listening to the podcast and built our first Kickstarter, which our first Kickstarter for the first chapter in full color was a successful one. It, we even hit our stretch goal where we got the second chapter fully colored as well for all the backers. That's awesome. Yeah. The one thing I've realized when you were saying that he said that you should start the single issue and do that as a yeah. Kickstarter, it's funny that kind of goes back to when you were working for video game testing, 
what they do is they do a minimum viable product. They'll be testing a part of the game and they'll go here, play this. You're not playing the full game, but you're going through and going, do people like this? Are there problems with it? Should we even bother with this part? And that's essentially what he took. So it's weird how it kind of like intertwined with the same kind of concept. Well, it helps grow our audience a great deal. Almost every Kickstarter, we end up with one or two new Patreons as well on our Patreon, which helps pay monthly bills like web hosting, just so we get a little bit extra income off of it. And we put that money towards various other things. We're going to actually take our Patreon money in probably January, February, and March. We're going to take all of that and dump it into making just a black and white print run of issue one of Conceptual Heist and drop it off at comic shops around Montreal. So how are you going to do that? You're going to do it manually, or are you going to just, like, uh, ship it to them? How do you actually reach out to comic shops? There are a bunch around Montreal, and I'll, we'll probably just sort of reach out to a bunch of them and sort of say, hey, free comic book day is coming up. Would you like to have some of our book in the stock as well, if you'd like? Like you'd offer them as free comics? Yeah. Oh, okay. Of course they would then. Three comic book days that are actually free for you. You don't even have to put money into them. Yeah. I've found over the years that there are so many options for getting a book or a comic book printed. So what option did Jay decide to use himself? He actually kept it local. So are you having them printed, sent to you, and then you're shipping them out? For what we'd be doing next year, we're uh, getting them printed at a local place where Matt does a lot of his personal printing stuff because he has an art book that we sell at cons oh cool they do fairly decent black and white books so it's sort of like yeah we can just do it there we'll print out like two to three hundred something like that and just hand out at the various comic shops with the kickstarter both times we've raised money for coloring and the printing we use a Quebec printing company. It's uh, about three hours out from Montreal. They're a little bit more expensive than other places in the base cost. But at the same time, we save on shipping because we're local for them. Uh, they ship for free. So they ship it for you? Uh, they'll, they'll ship the books for, to us, and then we do the mailing afterwards. The shipping is free when they send it to you. Yeah, they, when gotcha. they send it to us, it's free. What makes you go that route? In, I mean, I like that you're doing the printing local, but what makes you go that route instead of just doing a print-on-demand book? That way we have stuff ready to go when we're going to conventions. Print-on-demand isn't always as consistent. When you see our book, it is probably the highest quality single issue comic you will have ever seen glossy cover and it's like a heavy cardstock cover too we charge six bucks canadian on this book being able to get people to support a kickstarter for a comic i wonder what makes it stand out what does jay think makes the comic stand out to people just passing by the uniqueness of it part of where conceptual heist came out of was just the idea of a combination of jazz age fashion and high-end future technologies you have flapper girls riding hover motorcycles cyborgs wearing suits we call it jazz punk the combination of cyberpunk and jazz age fashion so it takes place in the year 2090 so it becomes this very unique very eye-catching different style and Matt is an incredible artist, too. I've very much lucked out being able to work with him. And he's not just a great artist. He gets better all the time. Mm -hmm. So in the opening bit of the comic, in the first issue, there's a fight sequence that Matt just really rocked out. What happens with the fight sequences is I will sit down and I will actually choreograph each fight scene. Like physically? Yeah, I will physically work out how (laughs) each fight scene works. Nice. (laughs) And I will work out the beats. There's actually, on our Patreon, our editor, Sean, Sean is also a fight choreographer. One of his major fight credits is the last Deus Ex game, the cyberpunk video game. He did the choreography for all of the special moves in that game. Oh, he helped me sort of make sure the choreography worked. So what you're getting at is you really put yourself into the work is what you're saying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
You can find out more about the Conceptual Heist comic that Jay does at his website, conceptualheist.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head over to my site at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list or find all the links to the things that I'm on, or even if you just want to ask me a question or contact me. That's AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening, and until the next episode, so long. Mm-hmm.